So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Kevin Mitchell, who is in fact one of the organizers for tomorrow's uh, meeting. So uh, Professor Mitchell is, uh, uh, comes to us from the uh, Smurfit Institute of Genetics at uh, Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. So he received his uh, bachelor's degree in genetics in Trinity College. Then he crossed uh, the Atlantic and the US continent to West Coast and received his PhD in uh, molecular biology in uh, University of California, Berkeley. He then did his uh, postdoc at Stanford University with uh, Mark Tessie Levine, who is now the president of Rockefeller University. Uh, so he then uh, joined back the faculty at uh, Trinity College in 2002. Uh, his own research has focused on understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms that assemble nerve cells into uh, brain networks. And he also thinks uh, broadly and deeply on how uh, abnormal development lead to neuropsychiatric disorders, which is uh, what he's going to tell us uh, tonight. So uh, please join me to uh, welcome. Thank you. Is this, is this live? Can you hear me? So thanks, um, thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here to uh, try to convey to you my sense of excitement uh, about uh, this field. Because I think after decades of frustration, we finally have an opportunity to make some real progress in understanding the roots of mental illness. And this is really thanks to revolutionary advances in genetics and neuroscience, and especially the integration of those two fields, which is something that we hope to promote through this uh, Wiring the Brain meeting, which will happen here over the next five days. And those insights that we're beginning to learn about the biology of these conditions and the causes of these conditions are starting to have an influence in the clinic. So I'm really hopeful that after you know, many decades of frustration, we can finally begin to uh, make some, some inroads to tackle that grand challenge of mental illness. And it really is a grand challenge because these uh, conditions are, first of all, very common. And this slide shows some of the um, rates of mental illness. So about 10 to 15 percent of the population are affected by a serious psychiatric disorder in any one year, and about 25 percent over their lifetime. And we all know someone who, who has one of these conditions, probably many people, in fact. And if you look at the rates of you know, these really serious conditions, like schizophrenia is almost 1 percent, bipolar disorder 2 percent, autism, epilepsy, intellectual disability, much more than that. And then you have you know, even more common ones down here. So these are very prevalent disorders. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about these ones, which we think of as neurodevelopmental disorders, caused by some change in the way that the brain has developed. And in addition to being very common, these are also very serious conditions um, that have a really, really severe impact on people's lives. And, I'm just as an example, we'll look at schizophrenia, which probably most of you, if you think about it, would think about hallucinations and, and delusions, these florid symptoms of psychosis. And those are very uh, important and real symptoms um, as part of that disease. But also, it, it's characterized by a much more um, deep uh, sort of disorganization of thinking, of uh, social interactions, of deficits in attention. Uh, executive function and planning, really every aspect of, of human mental function. Um, and it has very, very serious consequences for many patients. So about 40% of, of patients who get one episode of, of, of psychosis actually have a good long-term outcome, but that means about 60% of them don't. And in fact, um, the, so suicide rates are about 5%. The average life expectancy for men with schizophrenia is reduced by 15 years on average. Uh, and actually only about 28% live independently in, in the US. And in the US, just to give you a figure, there's about 2 million people with uh, schizophrenia. About 10% of them are homeless. And actually, schizophrenics make up about a third of the homeless population. So these are huge uh, impacts personally and also societally, and also economically, because the economic burden of neuropsychiatric conditions is actually larger than that of, of cardiovascular disease, or cancer, or, or many other conditions. Um, these are figures from Europe. In terms of the total cost in, in a year, economically speaking, they're comparable figures from the States. 
And this, I think, is a really stark um, figure which shows how poorly we've been doing in the field in terms of developing new treatments for these kinds of conditions. This is the number of drugs that had, had different sort of chemical mechanisms in the 1950s for depression, schizophrenia, and heart disease. And this is in the present. This is where we are for heart disease, so a dramatic increase in the number of different drugs that we can employ. For schizophrenia and depression, it's practically flat. That's 60 years with no real progress in terms of treating these conditions. If you think about cancer, there's now about 370 different cancer drugs. Okay, so what I want to do today is just talk a little bit about why progress in psychiatry has been so slow and talk about the impact of recent genetic discoveries that I think is really changing that, revolutionizing the field, in fact. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, too, about how we can go from understanding genes and discovering genes to understanding their effects on brain function and at the end, just touch on some of the implications for patients, which is it's at early days, but it's already starting to have an influence in the clinic. So these are some of the giants of psychiatry who over the last century have been responsible for really recognizing um, different kinds of syndromes like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and autism and Asperger's syndrome, um, and, and describing those syndromes and characterizing them in terms of the symptoms that people um, actually uh, express based on basically talking to the patients because that's pretty much all that has been possible. And those kinds of uh, investigations have led to schemes like this where people can be classified based on the symptoms that they have, based on the course of the illness, the time at which it, 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 um, it hits, whether it gets worse with time or, or, or oscillates back and forth and so on. And you can, you can recognize particular clusters of symptoms that tend to occur together, uh, that tend to have a particular course. So schizophrenia has a, a, a sort of a recognizable type of thing. Okay. And a lot of um, the history of psychiatry has been devoted to trying to delineate these various categories and separate them from each other. And in fact, that still goes on today. And actually, what I'm going to show you is that that may be, um, from a genetic point of view, quite, quite a wrong idea. So the obstacles to progress, the main one, really, is that diagnoses are based on superficial symptoms. That is just talking to people, okay? talking about their experiences, talking about what they feel, what they perceive, uh, and how they act, and so on. And actually, the medications that we have to hand have all been discovered serendipitously, just by chance. It's been found that this acts as an antipsychotic or an antidepressant. They're only partially effective, only in some patients, only for some symptoms. They, many of them have very bad side effects. And the reason that we have not developed any new drugs is that the underlying biology has been obscure. We haven't gotten into the black box of the brain. We haven't had a good way uh, to actually figure out what are the causes of these conditions. And that's changing. And it's changing because of this, because psychiatric disorders are genetic conditions at their heart. They tend to aggregate in families, and we now know that they can be caused by genetic mutations. But just the mere fact that they aggregate in families is not really proof that they're genetic conditions, because if something runs in families, you could say it's either due to, to nature, to differences in genes, but it could also be due to nature. So wealth runs in families, and wealth is not genetic. Speaking English or Spanish or Tagalog runs in families. Okay? So we need a way to separate the effects of genes from the effects of a shared family environment to be sure what are the actual causes of these conditions that, that keep cropping up in different family members. And one of the ways to do that is to look at family members who share the same family environment, but who are different in how genetically related they are to each other. And there's a, a natural experiment of biology, which is to look at different types of twins. So twins can be either identical twins who, who have all of their genes in common, or fraternal twins who are basically just like siblings who happen to be born at the same time. And what you can do in this experiment is look at pairs of twins and see if one of them has, say, schizophrenia or autism, how often does the other one have the same condition? And if it turns out that monozygotic twins, identical twins, tend to be more similar to each other in having that disease than these twins, then that means it's really a, a difference in genetics because the family environment is the same. And so those experiments have been done over many years. They're extremely conclusive for these conditions. This is the, rates of, um, this is the rate of one twin being affected if the other one is affected in D 
these kinds of identical twins or in fraternal twins. And if you look at this bar here, this is for autism. This is about 70%. Um, so 70% of the time, if one twin has autism, the other one also does. And it's only about 10 or 15% for fraternal twins. So a very big genetic difference here has a big effect on the outcome. The same for schizophrenia and so on. So what that really means is that the, it's the genetic differences that are important. It's not a shared family effect. And in fact, we know that that shared family effect has, has a shared family environment has no effect on whether or not you uh, express these um, conditions. So you can put some numbers on that. These are numbers that are called heritability, which means how much of the differences across the population in whether people get these conditions are down to differences in genes. And they're very large. So for autism, schizophrenia, genes play a major role. Now, not the full role, not deterministic, but a very strong role in, in causing a predisposition to these conditions. And that actually extends beyond just monozygotic twins. Um, these are the rates. So here, here, if one twin has schizophrenia, the risk to the other twin is about almost 50%. But if, say, a, uh, a child has schizophrenia, then the risk, or, or if a sibling has schizophrenia, the risk to the other sibling is about 10%. And you can go down these, these um, degrees of relatedness, you still see that effect. Okay? So it's a clearly familial um, condition. And one of the really interesting things that's come out in the last few years is that that risk extends across disorders. It doesn't respect these, these categories that psychiatrists have tried to um, put, put people in. Because um, this is the risk to someone who has a first degree relative with schizophrenia. It's their risk of getting schizophrenia themselves, which is about 10%. So about tenfold greater than the, the population risk. This is um, their risk if, if one sibling has autism, the risk that the other one will develop schizophrenia is almost four times greater. Okay? And the same for epilepsy. If you have a, a brother or sister with epilepsy, your chance of having schizophrenia is about twice as high. So these conditions are really not that separate from each other. They're distinct manifestations of the same underlying causes. And so this is a, a more accurate picture, I think, that these are, are different outcomes, possibly, but really that there's some overlapping um, etiology or causes of these conditions. So that's uh, the evidence, at least, that these are genetic conditions and that they're related to each other. But really what we want to do is actually find what the genes are that are responsible for these. And if you look at the entire genome, all of the chromosomes of, uh, of a human being, that's about 3 billion bases long, 3 billion letters of DNA, that sequence. And within that sequence, there's about 25,000 genes. And so if you look at that, uh, the chromosomes in a cell, this, this is what they look like, uh, conceptually at least, is uh, a, a strand of, or a double strand of DNA like this with a particular sequence of, of these bases, A, C, T, and G. And that sequence of bases at particular parts of the chromosome spells out a recipe for proteins. So that's what genes are, it's just a recipe for a protein. Okay? So you've got about 25,000 of those. And these proteins do all these little jobs inside your cells. They're basically like little robots um, inside your cells. Okay? So these um, bits of DNA code for these different proteins that do things inside your cells. Now, those bits of the chromosomes are vulnerable to mutations. And there's different kinds of mutations. One of the um, common types, the type that's actually fairly easy to see, is where a whole chunk of a chromosome gets either broken uh, or gets deleted or duplicated, or where the ends of chromosomes will swap with each other and, and, and break, possibly break a gene right in the middle. These are ones that you can see down a microscope. If you look at the chromosomes, you can actually see one is broken and attached to another one. So those are the, because of that, these kinds of mutations have been discovered fairly early on. And one of them is shown here. This is a, a pedigree where we have uh, males and females and their offspring like this. And all of the ones that are colored in here have a psychiatric diagnosis. So this is a, a famous pedigree from Scotland where psychiatric disease really runs rampant through this family. The reason it does is because all of these people have inherited one of these, um, these kinds of a translocation where one of the chromosomes is broken and attached to another one. And, and what you can see is that 
this manifests in very different ways in different people. So some of those people have schizophrenia, some of them are diagnosed with bipolar disorder or depression or so on. So again, this particular mutation doesn't respect those diagnostic boundaries or categories. Now, uh, a few years ago, a development happened which, uh, right here at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, based mainly on the work of Jonathan Sabat and, and Michael Wigler and their colleagues, some of whom are, are here tonight, um, which was a way to look at these smaller events, these little deletions or duplications of a bit of a chromosome that may delete a few, a few genes or duplicate a few genes. And um, their method was, um, was based on comparing the amounts of DNA in a patient versus a, a control person. And using this molecular method, they could find areas where the patient had more or less DNA along part of a chromosome. So as you look along a chromosome, there's sort of equal parts here. And then when one of them jumps up or down, you can see, OK, the, the patient has either less or more DNA right here. So it's a really, really powerful method. And it completely blew the field open. Before that, we had that one example, maybe a couple of others, of single mutations that can cause these conditions. And this technique really allowed us to see that, that was not, those were not exceptions. So people had thought those were exceptions, that those, you know, that disc one mutation really didn't have anything to do with schizophrenia in general. And in fact, what these are starting to show is that there is no schizophrenia in general. So here's a, a, a picture of some of these regions of these different chromosomes, starting at, at one and going to 22, these ones that are colored in here, where now people know a deletion or a duplication of that region can cause psychiatric disease. And again, just like DISC-1 mutations, they don't just cause schizophrenia or just cause autism. You'll find that in some patients they have autism, some patients may have epilepsy, schizophrenia, bipolar, and so on. And so, on. so we now know many, many of those different genetic conditions which can cause these psychiatric um, disorders. This is an example of a few of them down here. These little pie charts represent the um, different um, disorders that people who carry these deletions can manifest with. And what you'll see is that each of them can be quite broad and, and span the whole range of these. Some of them are, are more tending towards, say, schizophrenia. Some of them more tending towards epilepsy or autism. But again, these, they, they really show that these psychiatric categories are not, don't reflect distinct biological causes. Now, there's another type of mutation that can happen, which is just a single change, one little base one letter gets changed, say, from an A to a T or a C to a G. That can really mess up uh, the code for a protein. So if you have in the DNA a change here, that can lead to a change in the protein and either stop it working or make it work differently. And those mutations have been really hard to find. Uh, but now, actually, thanks to new genetic um, sequencing technologies, we're able to find a lot of them. And this is a list. Um, of some of the genes that we now know where single mutations in those genes, and th the names aren't important, it's the fact that there's many of them is what I'm trying to get across, can cause these different um, conditions, autism, um, intellectual disability, Tourette's syndrome, developmental delay, epilepsy, and so on. So the numbers of these are, are increasing all the time. And so this gives a really new view of, of psychiatric genetics, because what it says, well, first of all, these disorders that we have, you know, the psychiatrists have, have put into separate bins really have overlapping causes or etiologies. Secondly, each of those conditions can be caused by mutations in any one of a very large number of genes, which really means that they're not um, distinct, perfect categories. They're actually umbrella terms for many, many different distinct genetic conditions. And that's important information clinically. We want to know if a patient comes into the clinic with autism or schizophrenia, what's the genetic cause in that patient? Now we can tell something about the biology that's relevant to them and hopefully personalize uh, their treatment in the future. So this distinction between these rare syndromes that we know about, and many, many hundreds of those, and the common conditions is really uh, an artificial distinction because actually these common conditions are made up of these rare conditions. And in fact, the only reason they're common is because of the way that we define them. We define them on these very superficial symptoms of the way that the brain works, or the way that the mind works, in fact. The highest level functions of the mind is the way that we define these conditions. And those highest level functions are the ones that rely on all of the subcomponents. So if you think this is a, a useful analogy, I think, the, 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 the 
symptoms that we're talking about are really like performance of a complicated system like that. So if you mess up any of these parts of a, of a jet engine like that, you may affect the performance of the plane. And this is the, the sort of idea in, in psychiatric genetics. Now, the, the reason these things are common is because there's so many targets that can be mutated that will affect um, executive function or social interactions or perception, the really the highest level functions of the brain and the mind. So this is a, a slightly out of date, but um, it does show the progress that we're making. This is for autism. And up until a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, we could diagnose genetically two or three percent of, of cases of autism with a particular cause, maybe, maybe five percent. And now we're at 30 percent, and that number is growing all the time. So there's still a lot of unknown ones. We don't know yet. But the trajectory of our ability to genetically diagnose people is, is increasing all the time. And one of the things that, that's interesting about this is that, is that actually it shows us there's a much more dynamic spectrum of genetic variation in the population. It's not just that you inherit the DNA that your parents had kind of shuffled around. Every generation, there's new mutations that happen all the time. So in fact, because these mutations are, are cause serious conditions, like autism, like schizophrenia, they tend not to be passed on as much because people with autism and schizophrenia tend to have fewer children. And that means that those mutations don't persist in the population. So you might ask, how could those conditions ever be common? And the reason they're common is because we have new mutations. Every time sperm and egg cells are made, new mutations are introduced. And so what happens is, it's true, every generation, sometimes particular mutations are weeded out, but new ones arise. So even sporadic cases, even cases in a family that are not, don't appear to be genetic because they're not familial, can still be genetic at, at a biological cause because they're caused by a new mutation that happened just in, that, in, the, in the egg or sperm that led to that person. Now, I'm giving you a view of the genetics of these conditions that is slightly simplified because I've been talking mainly about conditions like this one, where the idea is this little red dot here is a mutation that happens in someone who gets a disease, and here's one of their relatives who doesn't get the disease, who doesn't have the mutation. And that's true. There, there will be conditions like that where we can really say this particular mutation is responsible. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's all very simple like that. In fact, a lot of the genetics is going to be much more complex. For many cases, there may be two mutations or three mutations and a bunch of little modifiers um, that in the genetic background that, that ultimately um, contribute to their genetic predisposition. And in addition to that, the genetics really is only a predisposition or a vulnerability. And the, the final outcome in any particular individual will depend on their environment, on their experience, also on chance events during brain development, uh, because we know that even you know, monozygotic twins don't develop exactly identically. So, um, so there's more to it than just genetics. But there's two reasons why I'm focusing on the genetics here. One is, as I showed you at the start, the differences in genetics explain a large amount of differences in the population and whether people get these disorders or not. Secondly, the genetics gives us an entry point to the biology, which is, I think, for me, the really, really exciting thing in this field right now. So um, I'm a, a developmental neurobiologist. I study how the brain develops. And people in this field for years have been studying genes involved in, in these kinds of processes that help the brain get put together. And the exciting thing is that the genes that are coming out from psychiatric genetics are the same type of genes. They're doing those same types of processes. They're really involved in the development of the brain. And so I want to turn now to, um, to actually talk a little bit about the development of the brain and how these genes may actually impact on that. So the the take-home message, I guess, from the genetics is that it takes a lot of genes to build a human brain. And mutations in any of possibly hundreds of genes can disrupt neural development, alter the way that these, uh, the brain functions, and ultimately result in psychopathology or the symptoms of psychiatric disorders. Um, OK, so in thinking about brain development, the central problem in understanding development is this. You have a single cell here, which will develop into a human being. In that single cell, in the DNA, is all of the information needed to make that human being. Okay. And in fact, in the DNA of any of you, is all of the information needed to make a person like you, not just any human being. Okay. 
Okay? So what we want to understand is how does that process happen and how does variation between people affect the outcome? And if you look at brain structure, um, it's an incredibly complicated thing to, to imagine how this can be put together. So through, through embryonic development, you get the, the development of this uh, incredible structure with hundreds of millions, sorry, hundreds of billions of different cells in there. And this is, a, um, this is, I think, a typical artist's rendition of what the inside of the brain looks like. You have these different nerve cells. Um, they all look the same. They're sort of scattered around at random. They're all connecting to each other at random. And you'll, you'll see you know, electrical impulses zip along through there. And nothing could be farther from the truth about what the inside of the brain actually looks like. So here's, here's another artist's rendition, which I think is, is both more beautiful and more accurate. Uh, it's by an artist named Greg Dunn. And it's based on real anatomical observations of the brain. And what you can see here is a few different things. First of all, you've got these big cells here, which uh, they're just not uniform. They have a morphology to them. They have a top and a bottom. They have an input side and an output side. And then you've got these cells, these red ones and, and golden ones, which are very different. So this is giving you a view of the fact that not all neurons are the same. There's hundreds, thousands probably, of different types of neurons that all also have to be organized in, a, in a, a very structured kind of a way for neural circuits to work properly. And this is a, um, a, a more detailed view of just a part of the cortex, this outer part of the brain, where I hope it comes across that you can see these different layers of cells. So you've got big ones, small ones, and they're organized in different layers. And those cells have different jobs to do. They connect to different regions of the brain, uh, and they perform different functions. And this is a, um, a really complicated, messy kind of a schematic. Um, this is the cortex up here, and, and these are supposed to represent these cells in different layers. And these colors represent cells in different parts of the, of the brain connecting to uh, other parts of the brain, like the thalamus and the hippocampus and, and so on, just other parts of the brain below the cortex. So the, the only point of my showing you this is to show you that there are many, many different cell types that have different jobs to do and different patterns of connectivity. And they all have to be organized. They have to be in the right place. They have to make the right connections in order for all of those circuits to work properly. So in terms of development, then, there are many things that have to happen. And one of the first things that has to happen is when neurons are born, many of them have to migrate through the brain to take up positions in these uh, different parts of the brain. And the way that they do that is actually like an amoeba. You know, you see an amoeba sort of crawling through its environment, sensing chemical cues in its environment, turning left or right. And it's these, these cells that migrate through the developing brain do exactly the same thing, only their environment happens to be the other cells of the developing brain. So they're looking for information about where they should go. And that information is encoded by the genes, that the proteins that these cells make or the proteins that those cells make out on their surface. So these cells can navigate through the developing brain to get to the right place. And when they don't, then you can get very serious conditions, uh, these disorders of neuronal migration, um, which can, can cause conditions that you can see oftentimes with magnetic resonance imaging. So these are very serious, sort of obvious uh, congenital birth defects for the most part. Um, but actually, what geneticists are finding out now is that the same mutations Sorry, this, mutations in the same genes that cause these conditions can also cause conditions like autism and epilepsy when they're less severe mutations in those same genes. Now, once you get the cells in the right place, you also have to connect them up to each other properly to make these wonderful, um, incredibly complex wiring diagrams of the developed brain. And um, the way that that happens to, to get all of these different dedicated circuits connected to the right regions is that, that growing cells, here's a little nerve cell, they extend this fiber, which will be the, the electrical connection, to another cell. And they, they grow that out where the tip of it, the structure called a growth cone, grows along just like an amoeba or a migrating cell. It just pulls the, the growing electrical cable along behind it. And they're responding to cues in their environment, too, that tell them where to go. And again. Those cues are encoded by different genes. So they're protein molecules that some cells make and some cells don't. If you, if you mutate those types of genes, then you can also get serious neurological conditions where, for example, um, you can have an absence of the connections between the two hemispheres of the brain. So this is a very serious condition, um, which is shown here. 
in comparison to a, to a typically developing uh, person here. And that can cause uh, obvious uh, neurological syndromes, uh, but in less severe cases can also manifest as psychiatric disease. So we're starting to know some of the types of mutations affecting those processes that can lead to some cases of um, psychiatric disorders. But actually, those, those are ones that are pretty severe. Those are the ones that show up on an MRI scan, and most of them don't. Most of the genes that are coming out seem to focus on this structure, which is really a microscopic structure. It's the connection between two nerve cells called a synapse. That's where this nerve cell, as it sends an electrical impulse down here, will, at the end of it, release a burst of chemicals that the other cell detects, and then it will send an electrical signal. So many of the genes that are coming out of these um, genetic studies actually act at that synapse. So here's some of the proteins um, which are involved in making synapses between cells. They specify which cells should connect to which other cell, uh, what type of a synapse they should make, and so on. If you mu mutate any of these genes here that make these proteins, then you can get autism, schizophrenia, epilepsy, and so on. Now, what we'd like to do is really figure out a lot more than that. The genetics is just a start. It gives us a pointer to where to look to, f to find out more about the biology. And really what we want to do is this, is ask how do mutations in those genes lead to psychiatric symptoms, and what would, even a, uh, what would a complete explanation of that even entail? And the reason this is a very difficult problem is that genes are so far removed from the manifestation of these illnesses, which are really psychological traits and behavioral uh, expression. So genes, all, all, all the genetics tells us is there's some link between genes and psychological traits. And what we need to do now, starting there, is fill in these functions. Starting from individual cells, what does the protein do that that gene makes? What are the functions that it carries out? What cells is it made in? What circuits do, does, do they take part in? And what are the processes that they actually um, control? And so we're just at the start of this. But genetics and, uh, is giving us the, the entry point and the tremendous progress in neuroscience that's happening lately where I think there's a really a, a critical mass and a momentum building now is, is building up this framework that, that we will be able to explain that. And one of the key things that's, again, coming out of the genetics is a focus on different cell types in the brain. And there's two major cell types which are either excitatory or inhibitory cells. So when one cell connects to another cell, it can either, make, it can either send a signal that makes the other cell send a signal, or it can send a signal that stops the other cell making a signal. Okay? So if all the cells were electrically active and all they did was, was activate another cell, then any time any cell in your brain was active, eventually all of the cells would become active, right? and you would have an epileptic seizure. Okay, the reason that doesn't happen is because of these inhibitory cells. These are the ones that put the brakes on. They give the balance uh, between excitation and inhibition that keep the, the, um, the overall level of activity in check. And so actually, if you mess up with these cells, if, if the cells are not there in the right place or they're not connected, they don't make the right types of synapses, then you do get epilepsy. And that tells us that um, this balance, sorry, that says EI imbalance for excitation inhibition can be affected by mutations that, that control many different processes in development, either cell migration genes, uh, synaptic genes that specify this connectivity, or even genes that specify the, the biochemistry within the cell. Any of those things, if you mess them up, you can alter this balance. If you get too much excitation, then you can get seizures. So this is one reason why epilepsy is so common, because it's easy to mess up that, that balance. But those neurons do a lot more than that. They, they're not just there to put the brakes on, and there's not just one type of them. There's hundreds of different types, and there's hundreds of different types of these excitatory ones. And in fact, these inhibitory neurons are really crucial to how the brain acts as a computer, so how it does computational processing of information. I mean, that's what neurons are for. And these different types of, um, of inhibitory cells, which actually Josh Huang is one of the major people who's characterized their functions, what they can do is filter the information that's coming into one of these neurons. So if, if this neuron is getting excitation here, then these neurons will make sure that, that it only integrates across a certain 
time window where it requires a certain amount of, of, of excitation in order to fire and so on. So those are absolutely key to the information processing capabilities of these circuits. So if you were an engineer designing a, a computer or a robot, these are the kinds of things that you would have in here as the control circuits that determine how these circuits function. So if you mess with them, you're not only going to get seizures, you're going to basically disrupt or degrade the, the information processing capabilities of the brain. The other thing that they do is actually mediate the function of multiple neurons at a time. So individual neurons don't just sit there working by themselves. They tend to actually work in, in ensembles, like an orchestra almost. And these inhibitory neurons, which are shown here, can actually get these multiple neurons to fire in a rhythm all together, kind of like the, a conductor or maybe more like a bass player in a band, uh, because they're connected to each other and each of them is connected to multiple cells here. So what that means is when one of these cells is firing, the other ones will tend to be firing too, then they can send a strong signal to another part of the brain. That's an absolutely crucial part of the way that these circuits function. And in fact, it's a crucial part of how different parts of the brain communicate with each other, because each of those parts of the brain will be firing with a certain rhythm, a certain frequency. And if two parts of the brain are tuned to the same frequency, if they're in phase with each other, then they're listening to each other. So if this blue part of the brain is firing with this frequency and it sends some signals, this red part of the brain is firing with the same frequency and it, it's listening. So these are talking to each other whereas this one is firing with a different frequency and it's out of phase, so it's not listening. So this is at least some part of the mechanism by which different parts of the brain talk to each other and convey information uh, in terms of uh, tuning of who they're listening to. Now, we have only a rudimentary understanding of that so far, but this is at least the kind of framework where you could say um, you can begin to understand how the actions of cells in, in microcircuits can ultimately mediate mental operations like the ones shown here. So this is a, a scheme of the, the brain during which a, a person is making a, a decision based on visual information. So there's visual information coming in here that gets processed through these different parts of the brain. Um, these visual parts have to be talking to these parts up here which are making a decision based on uh, the, you know, the expected payoff or reward. Uh, and then conveying that to actually carry out an action and do a motor command. So the way that these brain regions talk to each other is via this synchronization, which can be disrupted by those types of mutations that impact these, these synapses right down to the cellular level. Okay. Um, all right. I guess I have a couple minutes. Yeah? Okay. So I want to give you just one example of a particular mutation, um, a particular syndrome, where we now understand a lot about the basic biology, enough that we get to the point where we can actually say, not only can we diagnose that in a particular person, but people are now developing therapies based on that understanding of the neurobiology, and those are now going into uh, clinical trials. So this is based on, on modeling psychiatric disorders in animals, which sounds absurd. Right? I mean, it does. It sounds absurd to make a schizophrenic mouse or an autistic mouse. It's easy, actually, to make an epileptic mouse. That's easy. And in fact, we don't, no one wants to make a schizophrenic mouse. Right? What we want to do is make a, a mouse that has some aspect of the biology that causes schizophrenia in a human, and then understand what's going on at the neurobiological level in a mouse, because we can do experiments there that we can't do in a human. So the idea here, the pathway, and this is really a strongly proven pathway of success in, in other areas of biology, is to take some human genetic discovery, make a mouse disease model, which means mutate the same gene. So mice have the same genes that we have, effectively. They have the same brain regions that we have as well, which is slightly more complicated in us. Okay? But if we find a gene in human, we can find the same gene in a mouse, and we can mutate it. So we can make a mouse with a, the same mutation that causes a disease in human, and then we can see actually what's going on at the physiological level or the anatomical level in those animals. And because we can do all these different sorts of, of experiments in a mouse, we can look at development, we can look at physiology and anatomy and so on, um, and, and pharmacology, we can really build up a much better understanding and hope to translate that then back to humans. That's the goal. Now, one of the areas where that has been fairly successful is in the study of this condition, which is called Fragile X syndrome, which is actually 
probably the single most uh, common cause of intellectual disability. It's an X-linked condition, so it's a gene on the X chromosome. It's inherited in a recessive mode. And as well as being uh, a very common cause of intellectual disability, it's also a common cause of autism. About 1% to 2% of people who are diagnosed with autism have a mutation in this gene. Um, and actually about 10% of those people have, um, have seizures as well. This syndrome was described a long, long time ago, as early as 1943. And with this um, diagram, I love this diagram because it really shows how um, the very applied research into a particular clinical condition merges with decades of basic research just in basic neuroscience trying to figure out how the brain works. Without all of this basic research, none of this would have been any use because there would be no background to actually uh, figure it out. So the gene was identified in 1991, and it was discovered what the gene did in about 2002, uh, and I'll show you what that is. So at this synapse, these connections between brain cells, what you have is neurotransmitters released here, and it's detected on this side, and it causes a, an electrical signal. Okay, so that's just a transformation, transfer of information. But the other thing that synapses do, which is absolutely crucial to their function, is they change. Right? That's what the brain is for. It's there to react to its environment. It's there to make memories uh, to change itself over time. And the way that it does that at, at these uh, connections is that this protein here detects, also detects the neurotransmitter, and it sets up a biochemical cascade inside the, the neuron here which ultimately changes the sensitivity by changing the levels of these receptors on the surface. Okay. So every time your neurons are firing, you're, you're changing some things, especially if you're making a memory, hoping that some of your synapses are firing away. This process is happening right now. Okay. This protein here, fMRP, is the protein that's made by the fragile X gene, the one that's broken in those people who have fragile X syndrome. And the function of that gene, the function of that protein, is to put the brakes on this process. So it, it retards that process. If you get rid of it, then what happens is this process goes into overdrive. Okay. So something about the way the synapses are changing is altered. And actually, so people have made mice that have that mutation, and they can look at that from behavioral to anatomical to physiological levels. This is what the anatomy looks like. So here's a, um, a single cell. And along these areas of the cell, which are called the dendrites or the branches, you see these little, these little twigs or little spines coming out. And this is a really, really close up view of that. Each of those spines is a synapse, is a site where another cell is making a connection onto that cell. And what happens in the knockout animal, this, the fragile X model animal, is you get many, many more of those connections made, and they're sort of immature. And in fact, if you look at the connectivity between neighboring cells in the cortex, then what you see is there's much more connectivity. They tend to be more interconnected with each other. So you can go from a, this kind of a level, a microscopic level, to the level of, of circuits, microcircuits within the brain and see a difference caused by this mutation. And in fact, that manifests as a difference in the physiology of, of the cortex. So what this is, is bursts of electrical activity in a, a, what's called a wild-type animal, a, a normal animal, which have this characteristic pattern. And in the knockout animal, the model, you can see that these bursts are much longer. So there's the, these networks of, of cortical neurons are hyper-excitable and um, tend to fire together much more than they would before. One of the manifestations of that is seizures in these animals, which you see as well as in humans. So the animals have what are called audiogenic seizures in response to loud noise. But they also have uh, many other symptoms, which in some kind of way parallel some of the symptoms of, of fragile X syndrome in humans, impaired social interaction and hyperactivity and, and cognitive deficits. Okay. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, there are many examples of models like this, different mutations in mice, sorry, different mutations in humans that have been modeled in mice. This one's particularly interesting because of the fact that we know so much about how it works because there's an obvious kind of an idea here that suggests a therapy. Now, I've told you that this protein here normally puts the brakes on this process. If you get rid of this, this process is going into overdrive. So there's a natural hypothesis to test, which is that if you block this protein from working so well, you may be able to restore the balance of that process. And in fact, there are drugs that do just that. 
And when you give those drugs to those animals, you can reverse many of those symptoms. And those drugs are now in clinical trials in humans with that condition. And we'll see in the next couple of years whether they really work or not. Um, and we'll also see in the next couple of years whether they might be extended to uh, treat other patients who don't have Fragile X syndrome but who have many of the same symptoms. Perhaps there's other reasons why uh, this process can be affected due to mutations in other genes, but that same drug might be worthwhile. So this is a case where we've gone, and I'm using we in the very broad sense. I'm not taking any credit for this particular uh, discovery myself. Um, but in, in the field, we can go from studying these disorders, discovering genes, making models, figuring out the pathophysiology, and hopefully getting to a stage where rather than just hoping, trusting in luck to find random chemicals that seem to work, we can actually rationally design drugs based on an understanding of the neurobiology and uh, design novel therapeutics and, and test those. So I think that's the future, really, of the field. So um, just to sum up, then, the clinical implications. Um, so the, the, the picture I just showed you a second ago is a long-term hope. And that will take many years uh, and a lot of work to actually get there and get really new therapeutics in the clinic. But even now, just doing the clinical genetics, we can really make a difference, I think, because making a definitive genetic diagnosis matters, even if it doesn't matter for treatment right now. Um, just knowing that um, you know, a, a child has a fragile X mutation or a Rett syndrome mutation or a 22Q11 deletion or whatever it is, gives some definitiveness to, to a diagnosis, it really helps with acceptance of the, of the condition by uh, patients, by families, um, support groups, you know, spring up around these different kinds of, of, of syndromes. So there's a benefit to having a genetic diagnosis, even if it doesn't right now lead to a therapy. Um, I showed you for, for autism, we can make maybe about 30% of cases, which is really much better than it was um, before, and, and make that kind of a diagnosis. Now, there's a flip side to that, which is whether we can make predictions based on genetics. It's one thing if, if someone comes into the clinic with a particular set of symptoms and you find a mutation in, in them that you know can cause those symptoms, there's a pretty good bet that that's the cause in that person. It's, it's very different to, to take someone who has a mutation at age two or three or before they're born and predict whether they will get autism or will get schizophrenia because we already know that even identical twins sometimes differ, often differ. In these, um, in these conditions. So that's going to be much, much um, trickier, I think. OK, so um, just to finally, this, this kind of genetic diagnosis is going to happen. There's tremendous advances in, in genetic sequencing technologies. The first, well, not the first human genome, but in 2001, to sequence a whole human genome cost about $100 million. And as of uh, a couple of years ago, well, actually, as of now, it costs about $1,000. This took about 10 years. This takes about two days. So this is happening. Genome sequencing is going to be routine. It's gone from banks and banks of these warehouses of sequencing machines to little machines like this that actually have a USB port that stick right into your laptop, and you just put some blood in there. So this is, this is the new technology, maybe not quite ready for prime time, but will be shortly. So this genome sequencing will happen. It will become a routine part of medical care, and especially, I think, will have an impact in, um, in psychiatry. What that means is that we will no longer be left just lumping people together with a diagnosis based purely on, on talking to them, you know, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or whatever it is. If we can identify disease-causing mutations, even in some of them, then we can start to subgroup them by genetic diagnosis, and that will inform the ongoing clinical relationship between clinicians and their families uh, and patients and so on. The other thing that we can do in parallel is we can make mice that model those same mutations and we can really get into the nuts and bolts of the neurobiology, um, the, the cells and the circuits, and even do some of that in, in humans as well, ultimately to define the cellular defects, the affected systems, and as in the Fragile X case, to get to novel therapeutics based on a, a real understanding as opposed to just shooting in the dark. Um, and eventually, that, that will lead to new clinical trials. 
Okay, so I am going to leave it there and um, thank you very much for your attention. If you're interested in this type of thing, just, just blog it. Thank you.